an LMU uh, alumnus joining us today to give us a presentation that he calls Grasslands to Wildlands, Adventures and Stewardship. Uh, Derek's currently up at the Kentucky Natural Lands Trust, and I'm sure he'll mention a bit about that. Uh, there will be a period uh, following his presentation for discussion and questions. If you for, think you'll forget your question, you, you utilize the chat bar at the bottom. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Derek. All right. Thank you, Dr. Rollins. I'll go ahead and get started here. Okay, as uh, Dr. Rollins mentioned, uh, my name is Derek Lindsay. I'm a stewardship coordinator with Kentucky Natural Lands Trust. Um, I uh, am responsible for stewardship coordination and uh, land acquisition and program support for KNLT <coughs> along Pine <coughs> Mountain. And it sounds like my dog is going to have <coughs> a meeting too. <coughs> Zoe, quit. <coughs> Sorry about that. that um, okay, so let's see if I can get her to quit real quick. Zoe, quit. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, I think there must be a cat or something out there she's chasing. Um, all right. So, uh, again, I'm with the Kentucky Natural Lands Trust. Uh, we work on protecting Pine Mountain uh, and uh, we're located in eastern Kentucky. We protect uh, 125 mile long uh, stretch of uh, mountain along the Pine Mountain. Uh, Wildlands Corridor, and again, I'm responsible for land management, monitoring, project management, grant applications uh, from time to time, and primarily habitat restoration. Uh, so again, I'm out in the field. Um, so that's a place I like to be if I can. So it all started, uh, so it all started with Dr. Rollins' biology class, uh, what are mixomycetes? Um, this is probably uh, one of the slides that he gives uh, uh, and shows. Um, so again, this is kind of what got me started. And one of the first projects uh, that I was able to go out in the field with uh, Dr. Rollins uh, was our right in the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. Uh, it was a uh, project there that we and we had eight sites and it was a National Science uh, Foundation funded grant. Uh, There's three day field research, um, there were eight sites and it's pretty much just getting the lay of the land of how to conduct field research. Um, so here uh, we, he, they taught me how to set up the site most of the sites were uh, parallel transects that uh, had five collecting sites or collections at each site, five meters apart, uh, 1.6 kilometers uh, separating the two lines. And what do we need to uh, conduct and collect? Well, here are the field tools, uh, a knife, hand lens, collecting box, uh, paper bags, backpack, um, are huge help out in the field. Uh, in the lab here, uh, we, uh, at CMRC, we used uh, Petri dishes uh, for moist chambers, uh, forceps, uh, scissors, white glue, uh, to get the samples in the box, to stay in the box, not move around and damage them. Um, again, filter paper for the petri dishes, and then spent many hours behind the microscope. So uh, again here, the uh, 
this is easy, right? Right there's right there's slime mold right there. Uh, no, it's <laughs> it's not, but uh, they're a lot smaller than that. So it was a little bit harder than what I thought. Uh, so again, here in the field collections. Um, so we set out our transects and we started collecting leaf litter and uh, we were collecting hummus layer as well. So uh, here you can see big important step in any research project is data and writing down where you're collecting, what you're collecting and um, getting a good amount of information. So this is the first group. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Caldwell here on the left, um, looking for terrestrial snails, myself, Randy Dara, uh, photographer, um, Tom Smith, uh, Dr. Tom Smith here, looking at algae and cyanobacteria. And then there's, there's a familiar face there, Dr. Stevenson uh, and Dr. Rollins, uh, looking for slime molds. So all of this uh, all uh, led to some more research. And that research led to uh, Dr. Rollins and I talking and um, figuring out what, what can I do for my senior seminar for uh, at LMU. And our, uh, we came together and came up with Compare, uh, the comparison of myxomycetes found in African grasslands to North American grasslands, uh, which Dr. Rollins had done a project and uh, research in North American grasslands. So we uh, went from there. So my hypothesis or my alternative hypothesis that the assemblages of myxomycetes in African grasslands uh, are the same assemblages found in North American grasslands and the null hypothesis that the assemblages of myxomycetes in African grasslands are not the same assemblages found in North American grassland. So we came up with uh, that they could be the same with due to wind dispersal of the spores. Uh, so we were going to test that out. You can see, uh, well, now everything's budding out, so you probably getting a good amount of pollen and spores and other things. So here uh, is our, uh, we conducted our research uh, in Kenya at Masamara. And here is a typical site for uh, the Masamara site one. And again, this was another project that was uh, funded by the National Science uh, Foundation. And uh, we collected for a couple days there. Uh, again, here's another site. Here's another site, which was very uh, similar <laughs> to the other two, except there's a little bit extra in there, and we had to keep our heads on a swivel while we were out there. Um, here I am collecting uh, some of the uh, microhabitats that we had chosen to collect which were uh, aerial grass litter, which is anything that was uh, suspended in the air, uh, that was grass, uh, collected ground grass litter, um, also collected aerial forb litter and ground forb litter. And then my favorite one was that each site we uh, opportunistically collected five samples of dung. So the results from this research project, uh, there were three collecting sites uh, with 181 moist chambers, uh, 141 myxomycete collections, which yielded 25 species. 13 species were in common with uh, North American grasslands research that Dr. Rollins had conducted. So the fun part begins with the analysis equations to figure out what does all of this mean. Uh, use species richness and uh, Shannon and Simpson diversity index. I also use the coefficient of community and percent similarity index. So here, uh, 
the uh, microhabitats, grass and forb and dung here, uh, species richness uh, was the highest in the grass and forb. And then the Shannon diversity and Simpson diversity that showed that dung was the most diverse. Um, in comparison to Dr. Rollins's North American grasslands, they showed similar trends uh, between percent similarity uh, from each microhabitat and the uh, sorts and uh, uh, through the bottom uh, here on the left the coefficient of community. Um, again, Dr. Rollins had a lot more uh, samples than I did, almost uh, double, double the species, but the trends were uh, very similar. In conclusion, um, rejected um, the, the no hypothesis that the assemblages of myceids found among three different substrates, grass, forb, and dung are not unique in African grasslands. Uh, we did think that we found a new uh, species of dike. I will have to uh, revisit this with Dr. Rollins and Dr. Stevenson. But very unique with a few stalks. Um, so, again, with any research project, you have to give presentations, um, you share that uh, information. So here I am uh, giving a presentation uh, to some students here at, uh, at, in Nairobi. And here's the group of, that I went with, uh, Dr. Stevenson, myself, um, Dr. George uh, Urtu from the Nairobi National Museum, and Dr. Rollins. This guy right here, uh, was one of the things we had to keep our head on a swivel for. Uh, we actually saw him, was like, oh, this is great, awesome. We got to see a cheetah, uh, start taking pictures and then realize he's looking for something. What, what is he looking at? And then next thing we know, our driver takes off to the van that's pulled over changing a flat tire. So that was a very interesting uh, event. Uh, would have made the news if uh, our driver hadn't had some quick thinking, but still very cool to see and take pictures of. He got pretty close. Um, and then also this guy, um, we were thinking about doing uh, one of our sites there um, in the Mastamar and uh, we'll go on down and then we go on down a few meters and here's this guy sitting underneath the tree, just hanging out. Um, so another, interesting take on that trip. Uh, we also had an elephant try to charge us at one point uh, while we were in the vehicle. So again, uh, it was very interesting, great trip. Um, and so that trip led to another trip. Um, I was very fortunate enough to uh, apply and uh, be able to be a part of another National Science uh, Foundation funded grant um, that was awarded to the University of Arkansas, uh, Studies of Fungal Biodiversity in Northern Thailand. And since slime molds are part of that, I applied and was again fortunate enough to be accepted and get into this. Um, the Mixomycete assemblages uh, on characterized niches in northern Thailand was the research project that I was uh, that I selected. It was uh, we spent a month long uh, trip there in Thailand, uh, mostly research and uh, presentations and collection, and just working on a research project. Um, there were I was accompanied by three other. Uh, students from the United States uh, and we each uh, lived here at the Mushroom Research Foundation or Mushroom Research Center here in, in Northern Thailand. So again, while we were here, we were required to do a research project um, and 
I chose again uh, some micro habitats and assemblages to compare. So the again the purpose of this project uh, was to characterize the assemblages of myceets associated with different micro habitats. Um, and my hypothesis for this project is that I would find a difference in assemblages from one microhabitat to another. So I had six different sites. Uh, again, we were accompanied by, um, I was accompanied by three other students from the United States. And there were also students from Mayfell Long University and Chiang Mai uh, University as well. And so all of us were in here collecting all kinds of uh, mushrooms, slime molds, anything. Uh, that we could attribute to each research project. So I had a lot of help with my collections. And so anywhere we went, if we saw one, we collected and, and tried to, to take it. So um, so with the Mushroom Research Center, there's I had a lot of collections there since our lab was there. And uh, we kind, kind of go and wander around. Um, one of my other collection sites is uh, also that... Uh, uh, there. Uh, another one at Chiang Mai University. Again, anytime we were walking around that uh, we could find anything, we collected. Um, May Sai was another site. Uh, the, the Maasai Elephant Camp, we actually found uh, some stemonitis on a rail. Um, uh, we also got to see a really neat elephant show there as well. Uh, Dalithnan uh, National Park is another site. So the macro habitats that um, were chosen uh, for this experiment or for this project was a uh, ground leaf litter, aerial leaf litter, uh, lianus, uh, twig, branches, and uh, coarse woody debris. So ground leaf litter here, just anything that was on the ground was the leaf. Um, the aerial leaf litter, again, anything that was hanging up in the air, not on the ground. Uh, Lions were these uh, fine. You'd have, you know, sometimes there'd be some underneath uh, or on. Uh, and then a twig was uh, classified as anything less than one centimeter. Uh, branch was anything less than 10 centimeters. Um, of course, would it be anything larger uh, than a branch? Ah, there's Dr. Allen's eye that we found a plasmodium there, very large one there. And that's um, when it's not in its fruiting stage there. Again, there I'm with my tackle boxes ready to, to collect. Uh, here I am with uh, Dr. Uh, Tito Wincoco. Um, she was there with us uh, helping out with slime mold uh, and other fungal uh, research. Here I, we found a, another plasmodium that was getting ready to fruit. So here's one that uh, I took, was able to take some pictures underneath the microscope. Um, this one here is uh, Hematrichia colliculata. Um, always liked seeing those. Uh, here's another one that was found on the mushroom here, um, forest mushroom. Uh, it's Didymium iridis. Oh, that's not one. Uh, <laughs> this guy right here, it's no lion or cheetah, but still very dangerous. Uh, it's a white-lipped pit viper. I uh, found him lurking around. Um, luckily, I didn't step on him or anything. But I was actually looking for this guy, uh, uh, Hematrichia circula. It's a uh, very snake-like and tube-like mix on my seat. That... If I stepped on him, I would probably be okay. So here are some of the other collections and boxes that were uh, added to and attributed to a lot of my 
uh, research project there in Thailand. Uh, so the results um, had a total of six collecting sites, had 250 um, total myxomycete collections. And of those, there were 65 species. Uh, again, used the same analysis equations you know, used in Kenya to uh, show the diversity and again, the species richness. Uh, used the coefficient of community and the percent similarity to compare each community. And this is what I found. Uh, found that the coarse woody debris had, was the most species rich and the most um, species. The Shannon and Simpson Diversity Act showed that ground litter was the most diverse. And again, the, uh, the branch and area litter and the twig and ground litter had most similar uh, with the coarse woody debris in the land, it says, being the least similar. Um, with the similarity index, lioness and area litter, it's 58% similar species and branches and ground litter is the least with seven. So my Thailand mixomycete project, my hypothesis for this project uh, was that I will find a difference in assemblages from my one microhabitat to another. And in the conclusion of that experiment, the analysis shows differentiation in assemblages found in the character, uh, characterized microhabitats collected in Thailand. And again, uh, at the end of the research project, I was required and uh, gave a talk uh, presentation to uh, students at the University of uh, uh, Chiang Mai there. And um, as with research, you need to inform people about it, know what you're doing. And uh, so again, take another group picture. These were the students. Um, and Dr. Winkoko that uh, spent a month with uh, in Thailand. Um, had a lot of uh, great trips and times there. Um, they really like karaoke in Thailand. So uh, I, I shared uh, some embarrassment in not showing you all the karaoke singing in Thai. Um, probably wouldn't understand me anyways with my accent and then also trying to speak Thai. Um, but we uh, had a good time, made some good friends. And um, again, isn't that what it's all about? So, um, so that project uh, led to one of my most recent projects here uh, with Kentucky Natural Lands Trust. Um, and going with something a little bit larger than mixomycetes here, um, went with uh, my master's uh, through American Public Universities, and uh, and as through uh, had to select a thesis project. And one of Canalty's board members, who's also a professor at uh, University of Cumberland's. Uh, Dr. Sarah Ash uh, was working on some spotted skunk traps. So we came together and came up with uh, a project and that will actually uh, be published. Uh, our work and findings will be published this summer, I believe, or by the end of the year. Um, and that is the detection of eastern spotted skunks, uh, Spalagel uh, paturus, on Pine Mountain in southeastern Kentucky using baited enclosed track plates. Um, so again, um, one of the things that with research, you have to set up the site. So our sites uh, are set up very similar with the transects. Uh, we had four collecting. Um, four collection sites or spots to a site that were 50 meters apart. Um, we had seven properties along Pine Mountain, um, starting here 
to the west in Whitley County, we had four sites at Archer Binge um, State Nature Preserve. Following uh, east up the mountain um, to the next site with five collection sites at Kentucky Ridge uh, Wildlife Management Area. And continue to the next site that was the Narrows Preserve. Um, owned by Kentucky Natural Lands Trust. And we moved on up to Harlan and Letcher County, um, still on Kentucky Natural Lands Trust properties here uh, with uh, the Line Fork Preserve um, with six sites. And then the next two were Hurricane Gap Preserve in Letcher and Harlan. And the next, Two that were uh, up the mountain here uh, with a confirmed detection there, that black dot uh, was a Kingdom Come um, Preserve. And then we finished out with six sites on Hensley Pine uh, Wildlife Management Area uh, that's owned by uh, Kentucky Fish and Wildlife uh, Resources. Um, we did have a confirmed site there. So what did we use and how did we do it? So again, I mentioned that we used, we used faded track plates. Uh, you can see here on the left, uh, track plate consisted of uh, some corrugated plastic uh, sheets that we cut and made into our traps. Uh, these are non-invasive uh, method here. So I definitely didn't wanna do a live trap and have to handle any kinds of skunks. Uh, so with that, there was a insertable track plate that we put inside the housing and, uh, we put carbon, um, toner there on the front, you can see on the black there with contact paper behind it and then sardines in the back as a lovely treat for them stamping their feet on our, uh, trap. And then we also used a skunk lure that we, um, would place at the top of the trap. Uh, so here it'd be on the rock outcrop or on a tree at other sites. Here you can see some of the field uh, research uh, was in the snow. We conducted our research in uh, December of 2017 through March of 2018. Uh, it was the best time for spotted skunks uh, to be out and roaming around. Uh, and again, here's uh, Dr. Sarah Ash. Uh, she's preparing the one of the track plates here. Um, we there's that handy dandy tape that you use for your transects. Um, but also the uh, what we used to bait with were uh, sardines in uh, water. We place a small amount there in the back. Um, to attract. Um, and then also this rosebed skunk bait, which I wouldn't, wouldn't recommend getting too close to or getting it on your hands because it is very hard to get off. Um, and you does not smell, it does not smell like rosebuds at all. Um, so the results from that, um, project. Uh, we had a total of 30 collecting sites. Uh, we had 120 track plates in total. Uh, we did have two eastern spotted skunk detections. Um, so analysis equations here for these were a little different. Um, I used the latency to detection, uh, which shows the number of days until species are detected once we set the trap out. We also used uh, naive occupancy, so number of sites with detections divided by the total number of sites. And uh, LTD for uh, the confirmed detections were 12 days on both um, sites. So it was 12 days after we set up that we that the spotted skunk did come by. Um, not in the naive occupancy showed that there was a 0.07 uh, chance of finding that. So, 
So when we would go and check the track plates, we would have to identify the tracks. So uh, this is the one of the uh, confirmed spotted skunk tracks. Uh, you can see here um, the two additional pads. Um, the toes two, three, and four form a curved line. So the tiny crease there at the front of the metal carpels and then the um, metacarpal and carpal pad of the front feet here, uh, circle there that is unique to the spotted skunk. And here is a spotted skunk that I was able to get on a trail camera way after my project was done. And that's usually how it goes. Um, we tried to get some uh, on camera there were just to con help us confirm if that was it because it is a little hard to identify the spotted skunk tracks. Um, but again, he, he looks a lot different than a striped skunk uh, with his pattern there and he's a little bit smaller. Um, so conclusion of uh, that research was that we we recommended further in inventories for eastern spotted skunks on Pine Mountain and uh, comparisons of enclosed track plates to remote camera traps to detect the eastern spotted skunks in Appalachia. Um, our method was a little more uh, strenuous. We had to check them every three to four days. We checked the uh, we checked the each one for fourteen days. Checked it at least four times. Um, so that's a lot of work, um, and whereas we could probably set up a camera and not had to go out there as much just to rebate. Um, so again, there's no lions, pit vipers, or cheetahs, but there are these guys. Um, we did have a few disturbed sites. Um, you can see here he's finding our rosebud. I don't think he really likes it too much, but I'm sure he's going to enjoy the sardines there in the back of the trap. Uh, we did have some uh, issues with uh, some unwanted guests. We did get a few uh, uh, bears. We got a few domestic dogs and some other things, but... Um, all in all, it was a great research project. Um, and with all research projects, uh, there's always more, there's always more to do. Um, so again, part of my job at Kentucky Natural Lands Trust is establishing and uh, creating these research partnerships. Um, you can see here, uh, these are a few examples that I'll go into. Um, here with uh, Lincoln Memorial University, um, thanks to Dr. Rollins and Dr. Brandt, who were to, able to start a few projects um, and share some lessons here that we've learned in the field. Uh, we, up here in the upper left, we uh, installed some bear hair snares. Uh, the bottom left here is uh, former. Uh, LMU alum, uh, Kirsten Dunaway and Dr. Brandt working on a snake project for her senior seminar uh, research project. And then here we have uh, some on the right here, Dr. Brandt and some other uh, members uh, of CMRC and Wildlife Society uh, going on a hike at Callaway Gap Preserve. Um, and just, uh, we, I think we found a few green salamanders there. Uh, some other projects here is uh, Dr. Alan Risk, uh, Moorhead State University on the left. Um, he's a college professor there, but he primarily focuses on lichens and viral fights. Uh, so here we've collected a lot of lichens and other viral fights and in the field, uh, just doing uh, some biological inventories of 
some different places on Pine Mountain. Uh, here I was involved with um, assisting the uh, Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves with a snail um, inventory where we collected different um, samples of leaf litter, uh, dirt, and shells, anything that we could find. And, but I took collections um, on Kentucky Natural Lands Trust's um, properties across Pine Mountain. And uh, they should be publishing a guide to Kentucky snails here soon. Uh, here's another uh, project that we've also worked on. Um, as camera traps, uh, as KNLT continues to um, expand on Pine Mountain, we're trying to take inventory of what we have so that we, we can better manage and restore habitat in places. So here we have a uh, coyote, and bobcat, and elk, and a red tailed hawk there. Uh, we also uh, have been in the works with uh, Bernheim uh, Arboretum and Research Forest uh, in Central Kentucky to start establishing a Golden Eagle survey project that will be very similar to the red tailed hawk there uh, that's pictured with uh, setting up deer carcasses along Pine Mountain and just see what we get. Um, they have been uh, seen to be flying over Pine Mountain and Hopefully we can document them there. Uh, some more biological inventory projects that I've uh, assisted with, um, amphibian collections uh, with Office of State Nature Preserves, uh, with Kentucky State Parks, uh, and even on KNLT properties. Um, we, I've also, uh, had outings with the CMRC and for the herpetology class. Again, just any information we can get and find, it's all, someone somewhere is doing research on it. And again, here's some reptiles. Uh, again, another hazard out in the field, uh, this bottom left. Is, he may let you know he's there, but sometimes they won't. Uh, but again, it's just been out in the field and uh, somebody somewhere is looking for something you may see every single day. Uh, so just uh, outreach and, uh, and working with others. Uh, here's another uh, thing that we do. I'm, I'm by no means a botanist, um, but I, I see flowers. I can take pictures of them and get them to the right people. Um, but there is a very rare, a very rare flower that is uh, orchid, uh, the rose pagonia here in the middle. Uh, it's found in one location on Pine Mountain um, that KNLT has helped to uh, protect as well. Uh, also do uh, cave surveys from time to time, uh, doing bat counts or Getting, getting surprised by uh, wood rats or other small creatures in crevices. Uh, up here in the upper right, there is a, this is an endemic cave beetle that is only found in KNLT's Icebox Cave near Pineville. Uh, it's only found there, nowhere else. Uh, very unique uh, beetle there. So uh, some of the other things uh, that I have uh, been fortunate enough to do uh, is when I worked with uh, Kentucky Fish and Wildlife, um, doing a lot of different surveys and other things, um, mass surveys uh, for trees, uh, just to see how the forest health is doing. Um, Grouse uh, habitat restoration with wildfire or brush cutting and clearing. 
Um, also doing grouse uh, drum survey routes, um, wood duck surveys on the river uh, where you float the river all day and just document if you see anything. Also been involved with elk and deer trapping. Um, also here on the bottom right, been fortunate enough to do some bear den research. Luckily someone uh, tranquilized the mother or I probably wouldn't be here. Uh, but there were four cubs and we ended up pit tagging them and changing the collar out on, on the mother. Um, also we've done some mist netting uh, with some birds and bats. Um, just a lot of different little projects uh, here and there. Um, but again, um, I've been very fortunate with uh, all the research that I've been able to conduct um, overseas and different countries and just being able to be out in the woods um, and then have a career and uh, that allows me to uh, just get paid for being out in the woods and flipping rocks and looking for things. So uh, I guess with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Dr. Rollins here.